Welcome back to ECE 442-542. If you're a little confused, if you're looking at the upper left-hand corner at the date, this is actually a redo of a lecture that was done without the audio working on Monday the 27th of April. And for that reason, I'm going to quickly go through some of this material and in particular probably not even worry about these announcements. If you were in class, you picked those up. Our goal today is really to work through the transfer function-based controller design by first starting with the PI controller that we've already looked at and show how we can transition into a PID controller pretty smoothly. And we'll do that by looking at this root locus tool within MATLAB or the function RL tool. And then we will quickly talk about general controller design using the root locus, and maybe we'll illustrate that with this RL tool. It may depend on my mood when we get there, but we didn't do that in yesterday's class that didn't have the audio, but we'll see how we go through today. Let's just remind ourselves where we are in terms of controller design, and in particular now we're talking about for the controller, capital C of Z, being this PID controller, which as capital C of Z is illustrated below the block diagram, it now has fixed poles, two fixed poles, one at the origin and one at Z equal to one. The pole at Z equal to one is giving us the zero steady state error due to a constant input at the reference input if indeed our closed loop system is stable and we will try to select beta 1 and beta sub 2 such that we do achieve closed loop stability in the system. As a way of working through this PI transitioning into a PID controller, let's go ahead and return to our plant that we've been playing with, an unstable plant, 1 over z minus 2. It has one pole at 2, and our PID controller will now have a pole at 1 and a pole at the origin. Those are the two x's in red. And then what we want to talk about today is how we might select the two zero locations, beta 1 and beta sub 2. And those two zero locations could be two real zeros that could be equal, or they may actually be two complex conjugate zeros that are somewhere in the z-plane. We are, again, working with a discrete time system, and so this complex plane is the z-plane. And we want to figure out how do we pick beta 1 and beta 2, adjust the gain, k bar, in our controller, to achieve closed loop stability and potentially then sliding beta 1 and beta 2 around or adjusting those and adjusting the parameter to gain k bar to achieve a more acceptable transient behavior. We've really looked at this from one particular strategy and that is to determine closed loop pole locations, and then with the PI controller, how do you locate that single zero to make your root locus pass through that triangle location or the closed loop pole location? Now what I'm suggesting is it may actually be easier to simply try to locate beta 1 and beta sub 2, forgetting right now about a particular closed loop pole location, and simply try to achieve a stable closed loop. And then, after we've achieved a stable closed loop, then start adjusting beta 1, beta 2, and the gain to potentially relocate those closed loop poles to be in more acceptable locations. And that's what this note is really trying to, sta to state. It may be easier to stabilize the system and then worry about how to move around the adjustable parameters, which in a PID controller are the two zero locations and the gain to fix the closed loop poles at a particular location on the root locus diagram. We've already actually looked at that 
single pole unstable system and controlling it with a PI controller. Here I'm showing what that was with this capital C sub 1 of Z having the integrator term which is the pole at 1 and the 0, a real 0 at 0 0.9833 and then we selected the gain to be 1.2002. We want to now transition into and hopefully be able to achieve maybe a better performing system, whatever that means, by introducing a PID controller or injecting the derivative term in our controller. And that now amounts to adding a pole at the origin and another pole, I'm sorry, another zero factor, z minus beta one. Now I hope you can see that in C, capital C sub two of z, you can force that to equal capital C sub one of z if you select beta one to equal zero, then that first bracketed term up above in the top, and maybe I should go ahead and be consistent with the notation, I think that's now k bar, that now just becomes z, that z cancels the z downstairs, and beta sub two, if we set that equal to 0.9833 and adjust k bar to be 1.2002, then our PID controller, we've essentially eliminated the derivative part and it becomes consistent with the PI controller that we had designed in an earlier lecture. Let's then look at how we can start to do this using MATLAB so that we don't have to always be trying to manually calculate or sketch all of this material Let's see how we can transition from different controller designs and use this particular function, RL tool in MATLAB to help make the design process maybe a little bit more efficient. We're now sitting in MATLAB and let's go ahead and define our original plant which was a first order system, our numerator was just a one, our denominator had a pole at z equal to two, and let's just assume that we have not selected or we don't have a sample period for this discrete time system. This is now our unstable system that we are trying to now stabilize. We've learned in a previous lecture that we can actually stabilize this system with a PI controller, and in this discussion, let me go ahead and assume that I am not going to introduce the gain in this controller. I will do that manually or graphically once I've entered into this RL tool function within MATLAB. And again, I'm not going to specify a sampling period so that now this controller is consistent with our plant. So here is our PI controller without a gain specified. Now let's go ahead and go into root locus tool and it now starts to create this single input, single output graphical user interface design package. And we will then try to illustrate how we can use that to enhance or make our controller design a little bit more efficient. If you want to learn more about this, then go ahead and click on help right now or in this particular point once RL tool opens, I'm going to skip that and simply start talking my way through some of this package by this or with this example that we're using. This screen, this design task window, will actually contain our root locus once we've introduced the system and controller into this RL tool package. And we can do that by using this tool manager. Notice that the current architecture that is being used has the controller in red or C. The plant itself is G. 
we will not have any feedback dynamics. H will simply be unity and we aren't going to pre-filter the reference input and for that reason this green block F will just let that be unity or a scalar one also. But now let's introduce our plant G and our controller C because we've already put those in the MATLAB workspace. Let's click on system data. We can now say if I want to put in data for the plant G, remembering what we have for our system architecture, I will browse the workspace and we have that already given to us by G1. Let me go ahead and import that and now you can see that that unity gain that was a part of our plant has now been changed to G1. Let's now go ahead without closing this up, let's say let's import a model for our controller C by clicking on the menu or the right arrow down on the menu and now highlight C1, import that. Now we have C1 imported. We can close our model import window menu. We can say that's okay. We now have G1 and G2 and we can now go back to our design task window and see that in fact we do have this root locus that we would have expected. We have our plant pole at two, we have our PI controller pole at one, and we also have our controller zero very close to that at 0.98. If we now wanted to, we could move this, these purple or magenta squares represent our closed loop poles and as I hover over there over them and it turns into a hand and if I left mouse click you can see at the bottom of that window that it's actually telling me where my closed loop poles are and we had said we might want to locate those at point nine and now I'm getting a little bit more challenged by trying to make those B.9, but we might also utilize a little bit more of the features of this particular package by going back to our manager and saying let's now look at some plots associated with this root locus and what happens when we vary those plot or those closed loop poles. Right now we have no plots specified indicated by the none. Let's go ahead and say our plot one will be a step and if we tell it to now display in plot one the closed loop response from the reference input R to the output Y, this is now our reference input that, I'm sorry, this is our output response due to that reference input. You can see that we do have zero steady state error but it pretty dramatically goes up. We can determine some of the characteristics by saying let's look at the peak response and now we can in fact see that our peak response is giving us a percent overshoot of 350 percent which is quite a bit but at least now we are stable. We started with an unstable system and now we actually have a stable system. Don't put too much <laughs> weight on this units on the time axis. Remember we did not specify a sampling period and for that reason these numbers on the horizontal or independent axis or the time axis are really corresponding to the number of sample periods. 10 being 10, 10 sample periods. We're now peaking at eight sample periods in and we have a peak amplitude of 4.5 when we're trying to go to a one. Now it's sometimes helpful to actually see more than just the response of the output due to that reference. We could on the same plot show the response of our input due to the reference input, the same reference input now everything is collapsed down and we can see that our input goes down to minus 4.5 to drive our system to this final value of 1 after a particular settling time and we could even show
that characteristic if we wanted to for both points. Now our settling time is 48 samples or basically 49 samples in roughly both cases for the output response and the input itself. And if you didn't like that, you could actually set this up to maybe say, well, I want plot 2 to be a step, and I don't want the two plots on the same diagram so that I can now more easily potentially see those. I can right-click on that information box and delete it, and now I have this output response in figure one, the input response on figure two, and they are in two separate windows as indicated from this tool manager in the analysis plots screen. Now what's instructive here is if you now start to take this design window, which helps illustrate the closed loop poles, you can show how those poles, when you do adjust those, now you're basically at two real poles. That's now looking a little different in terms of the response. Our overshoot is not quite as high as it was. Now we have a 276% overshoot. And we could look at what happens if we actually went in the wrong direction, now it's pretty clear that we are going unstable because our closed loop poles are outside the unit circle and the step response for both the output and the input to the system are going unbounded. We probably don't want to do that and we could look at driving those poles even harder with our system response. And now you can see that this is giving you some sort of rapid response on your input or rapid fluctuations on your input. And this pole near Z equal one is giving you this slow decay. Now your settling time is out to 112 samples instead of whatever it was before, maybe closer to 50. And that's because now this may be fairly fast, but you've now made this particular pole much slower, and you may not like that. So you might actually want to think more about trading off this speed of response. Now our settling time is 32 samples, and our percent overshoot is 323. And that's because where we have these closed loop poles located. If you wanted to, you could right mouse click and instead of looking at this unit circle only, you could actually superimpose the grid, which has the zeta lines and the constant natural frequency lines, and now you can see that as you move and increase or decrease zeta, that does correspondingly reduce and increase your percent overshoot, but note that a zeta value of 0.7 or 0.8, which corresponds to 5% overshoot or less in a pure two-pole system, obviously you are not getting a percent overshoot of 5% since you're upwards of 340 percent, but that's because you now have a real zero in play in this closed loop transfer function behavior associated with this zero and these closed loop poles at the purple locations. This is now our PI controller. Let's now transition into the PID controller, and we can do that actually on this design plane. We can introduce a real pole, we can introduce a real zero. These double poles and double zeros showing that line in between really just says these are complex pole pairs and complex zero pairs that you would be introducing. We just need to introduce one real pole and one real zero, 
to convert this PI controller into a PID controller. If I now say, let me put a real hole in, and we know at the PI it's supposed to be at the origin. If I don't quite hit the origin, that's not a real big deal because I can actually go in to the manager screen again, go back to the compensator editor, and highlight the real pole that I got close to zero but not quite. I can now go into the editing box and fix that zero to be right at, I'm sorry, fix the pole location to be right at the origin. I can now go back to my root locus and that does look consistent with three poles and one zero. We now have a pole zero excess of two. Our infinite, two infinite zeros are at plus and minus 90 degrees and our root locus branches will approach that. This is not a PID controller yet. We need to introduce a zero and if we put a zero in there, now we are looking like we have a little bit better response and we could also show the system response for those new poles and or pole and zero in this system and we again we could move these closed loop poles around changing the percent overshoot behavior or the settling time what we might do though is we might actually grab that zero and change the root locus shape a little bit now you can see that at least one of those purple closed loop pole squares, and in fact two of those, two between z equal 1 and z equal 2, are outside the unit circle, and our response is showing an unbounded response. We need to increase the gain and at least get those closed loop poles inside the unit circle and hope that this pole hasn't slid through or outside the unit circle once we've started to adjust those closed loop poles, complex closed loop poles inside the unit circle and in fact we haven't. And if we weren't happy with the particular location of those zeros, again we could go back to the manager and we could say let's let this one real zero not be at point one six, let's just let it be at point one and you will with experience figure out where you want those to be. Let's put this one now, I'm just sort of showing you what you can do, let's let that be at point nine and now let's back off of the gain a little bit because this guy has now slid beyond the unit circle. Let's again put those poles somewhere. Maybe we want to increase the damping in those and we haven't yet really pushed this pole too close to z equal minus one which can actually be sort of a no-no if we're not careful. If we look at what's happening here as we get that pole one of the closed loop poles near z equal 1. Look at, look at what happens to our input. It now starts violently swinging with each sample back and forth and in fact if our input was somehow constrained by an amplitude let's say of plus and minus 2 then we would actually be saturating and we would not see this kind of a response in our closed loop system. For that reason, we usually want to keep our closed loop poles a little bit away from this sort of undesirable location of z equal minus 1. We could again right mouse click on this screen and show the grid and again maybe put that at a damping ratio that's maybe a little bit higher. We could maybe put it at 0.9. We can go over here and now we see that we have a percent overshoot of 112 percent instead of in the 200 percent. It's overshooting rather quickly. It's taking one sample period to get to its peak and it's actually settling quite rapidly now. It's now settled in 14 samples and we are probably a little bit more
liking of this PID controller response versus the PI controller response, we've had al allowed ourselves a little bit more flexibility by introducing this additional zero and this additional pole, which is really the derivative term in our controller. We could mouse over or put our hand, yeah, mouse over those closed loop poles, left mouse click, and you can now find that the closed loop poles are at 0.65 and 0.1, plus and minus J.1. Now what you may not want to focus on too much is this particular loop gain, and part of that is because this package is actually doing sort of a conversion into a W frequency domain perspective, and that's not really necessarily what we're used to looking at. What you might do is now put these particular controller parameters directly into MATLAB and use the original root locus commands that we learned and define or find the gain of your controller maybe for poles close to this location in the root locus commands that we've been using before. Let's now put in our PID controller via this transfer function and suppose now we don't want to manually multiply those two first order polynomials. We had one factor with a 0 at point 0.1. We had a second factor with a 0 at 0 0.9. And again, we don't want to specify. Whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself. If these are just row vectors in MATLAB, but to tell MATLAB that they actually are corresponding to polynomials when we multiply those two row vectors, and we know that those row vectors correspond to polynomials, then we need to use the convolve function to actually multiply those as if they are polynomials. That's now our numerator. Our denominator is a little easier. That was just a, in terms of a PID controller, We have now transitioned into, we put our zeros at 0.1 and 0.9, and our PID controller poles are fixed at Z, the origin and z equal to 1, and this we can multiply out pretty easily. That's just z squared minus z plus, let's say, 0. There is no constant term when we multiply that out. I'm going to go ahead and manually insert that as a second order polynomial. That was z squared minus z plus 0. Now I can say that I'm not going to specify the sampling frequency. This is now the PID controller without a gain which is yet to be determined. If we wanted to know where, if we were in fact computing the zeros properly with that convolution operation, we could say, what are the zeros of the PID? Those are at 0 0.9 and 0 0.1. And we could say the poles of the PID, which we know where those are, Those are at the origin and z equal 1. We're pretty comfortable now that c sub 2 has the right, our PID controller has the correct poles and zero locations. Let's now compute a loop gain or the product of that PID controller with our plant. We can now say, let me compute the closed loop transfer function by inter or putting that closing the loop or feeding back unity gain around that loop gain. This is now T sub C is our closed loop transfer function. We can say, what are the poles of T sub C? Those are now unstable with that particular choice of gain. 
So that's not what we want to stop at. Let's now go ahead and introduce a new figure window. Let's sketch the root locus associated with that root gene. And that's consistent with what we had seen before. Let's now find an um, acceptable gain value using the root locus find command for that root gain. And now the cursor will allow us, or the crosshairs will allow us now to, let's go ahead and put that one complex pole at about, well, let's say at about 0.6 plus or minus j.2. And that's going to say that we need a gain of 1.933 to give us complex poles at 0.7 plus or minus j.2 roughly. Now we can go back and we can say, let's introduce that gain value into the root gain that we just computed. This is now going to do that. We're just going to scale the original root gain by the answer that we just had, which was the 1.9337. We can now, let's go ahead and up arrow that until we obtain this TC again, except we need to make sure that the root gain is the proper root gain, which I've now redefined as root gain underscore G. This is now, I hope, a more acceptable closed loop transfer function. We can say, what are the poles of that? And now those are at 0.7 plus or minus J.2. And we have one pole in the left half plane, but not too close to Z equal 1. And in a new figure window, we could actually look at the step response of that closed loop system. And in fact, it looks pretty similar to what we had before. It's a little different. We don't have quite the gain that we had in the RL tool window, but we could increase the gain again a little bit more and drive those poles to have maybe a smaller imaginary component and maybe achieve less of an overshoot. And we could see maybe where we want those by toggling between this root locus design approach. This now was with poles at 0.65 plus or minus J.1, giving rise to some transient behavior of our output looking like that, versus we now had maybe our closed loop poles at more like 0.2. Let's see, is that where those are? That's about where those are. And now that should look pretty similar to what this looks like because our gains are roughly the same. A little bit different, but not much different. That now, I hope, helps illustrate how to use RL tool using and allowing us now to fairly smoothly transition between a PI controller and a PID controller. Let's now look at, and in the class I actually had you looking at this on your own. Now I'm going to just kind of quickly go through this general control design process, which now Think of having your two shakers. You have a pole shaker and a zero shaker, and you can arbitrarily locate these poles and zeros at will to try to achieve a particular behavior. Let's now look at using these sprinkling of poles and zeros of a controller to stabilize a system that is given by z minus 1 for a numerator factor and two poles, a pole at 1 half and a pole at 2. We want to see if we can stabilize 
with some control or C of Z. To examine this, we can start thinking in the Z plane. We have nominally we have a pole at one half and a pole at two, and we have a zero at one. It should be clear from this if you now tried to use just a pure gain controller, this pole as it marches off is fine until you reach minus one. There is an upper bound on the gain, but this pole is stuck between z equal 1 and z equal 2, and it will never be stabilized with a pure gain controller. So we have to do something other than design a pure gain controller, because that gives rise to this unstable closed loop system. And what we need to open up about and be a little bit more creative now is to actually not restrict our attention to always placing poles and zeros inside the unit circle, we can actually, we can distribute these poles and zeros wherever we want in the z-plane, and our objective now is to try to eliminate this real line segment from the root locus, so that we're not stuck between z equal 1 and z equal 2 for our root locus. And we can do that if we actually put a pole there, and this won't give us a stable system, but if we put a zero there, now effectively that pole and zero right here are eliminated. We can basically filter those out as we're looking, and we now have some root locus that has these two branches which if we crank up the gain enough, to pass our closed loop poles into the unit circle, then we will be stable. What we want to avoid is pushing the gain so high, or making the gain so high that we actually exit the unit circle with one of those poles. So we do have a limit, range limit on our gain, but this is the strategy. We can now stabilize this nominally unstable system by the appropriate choice of pole, and in fact, an unstable controller pole is actually helpful. And to make our analysis even easier, we could just say, well, we get the idea. Let's just go ahead and create a design that will make our analysis even easier. We'll cancel that particular zero. That's OK to cancel because it's inside the unit circle. We will put our controller pole right there on top of the other pole at 2, and now we know that the real line segment to the right and to the left of z equal 2, neither of those are on the root locus. We now have a root locus that is a pure circle around that zero center. Again, if we remind ourselves of what we have with our unit circle, 
we can see that there's a minimum k value. There's a maximum k value. And there might actually be a k value that would be pretty easy to compute. For example, we have our system that was this g of z equaling z minus 1 over z minus 1 half z minus 2. We've now created a controller that has a zero on top of that stable pole at z equal to 1 half. And we've actually introduced another pole at 2. We now want to adjust the gain k to accomplish some gain value between k delta and k square. And let's just for starters compute k, the k easy, which is when k is equal to or evaluated at z equal to 0. And we know that the magnitude condition holds so that now we have this k times our plant. We don't have to really worry about that factor anymore. We can now solve for k. k is now equal to z minus 2, and we have two of those factors, so we can just square that distance. We have this factor coming to us from our zero factor. It's now in the denominator. We want to now find k star, which is k with z equal to zero, and that now becomes So we could now compute the system when we have basically our closed loop poles at the origin or a deadbeat response or a k star value equal to 4. We could find our k max. That's when k is evaluated at minus 1. That's now going to be minus 1 minus 2 squared over minus 1 minus 1. This is now 3 squared over 2, or we now have 9 halves, oops, or we now have 5 and a half, or 5, I'm sorry, 4 and a half, or 4.5. If you look at this figure and just think about it for a little bit, hopefully it's clear that that minimum value of k, you can actually see is associated with the distance from the origin to the unit circle is obviously 1. This radial distance from the center of that circle, which is the 0 at 1 out to 2, that likewise has a distance of 1. And it's obviously that this third side of our triangle from the origin to 1 has a length of 1. K triangle is or the minimum value of k is found at the z point corresponding to that tip or angle associated with an isosceles triangle. We now have this isosceles triangle that's giving us this triangle location. This particular angle is 60 degrees, so that that location is now there's our distance of 1. That's a 1 cosine of 60 degrees plus j sine of 60 degrees. And if my memory serves me right, the cosine of 60 is 1 half, and the sine of 60 is this square root of 3 over 2. If we now plug that in to our formula for k, we now are saying evaluate 
that K expression and Z is equal to Z triangle, which is 1 half plus J square root of 3 over 2. We now have 1 half plus J square root of 3 over 2 minus 2 squared and 1 half plus J square root of 3 over 2 minus 1. If we now look at that, hopefully we'll be able to do a little bit of the math. We now have minus 3 halves plus j square root of 3 over 2 squared. And downstairs we have 1 half plus or minus 1 half plus j square root of 3 over 2. So upstairs we have that distance squared where we have 3 halves squared plus 3 over 4. And downstairs we have now 1 fourth plus 3 over 4 square rooted, which is just 1. But upstairs we now have 9 fourths plus 3 fourths. Hope I'm doing that right. Which is, and this downstairs is just 1, so that now we have 12 over 4 divided by 1, or that's now. Did I do that right? I think I might have. So now k delta is equal to 3 to get us to that particular triangle location in our root focus diagram. And we could even go back to this particular root focus tool and see if we could obtain something similar so that if we go back to our MATLAB and we say, let's say this is now G2 is equal to this transfer function, it's now a numerator of 1 comma minus 1. We had a 0 at 1. Down here we actually, let me just say that we are convolving a factor with a pole at 1 half and a pole at 2. And let's not worry about the sample period. That's now our system. We can now say that suppose now our controller, let's call that CC2, is now equal to a transfer function. We went ahead and put let me remind myself of what we did. We put a pole at 2 and a 0 at 1 half, so that now we have 1 comma minus 0 0.5 and 1 comma minus 2. We can now go back to this particular system. We could, maybe what we want to do is, well, you can do this many different ways. If I right mouse click, if I now highlight all of those and right mouse click and say delete, I've now deleted all of my con systems here and my controller. Let me go back to the architecture and include or import some new data. Let's browse for that. That's now what we call G2. Let's import that. Let's now import, import our controller to be CC2. We'll close that and say that that's okay. And let's see what our root locus looks like now for that particular system. And now that doesn't quite look like what we had before. But if we go back to this and look at the compensator editor, we are actually there introducing this negative gain because of this, they're assuming a negative damping. Let's go ahead and get rid of that sign that they've now introduced. 
and now it looks a little bit more like what we were thinking we would obtain for our particular system and what we want to do now is adjust now it's not really looking like what I expected and that's because for whatever reason they've gone ahead and located that zero in the left half plane let me now get rid of that and move it over into the right half plane so that's canceling that pole and now I want to actually introduce back that negative sign so that I hopefully get something that looks more like so because of the way that they are introducing this change of variable that negative sign is causing problems with our consistency on the root locus and in fact they were sort of sketching the root locus for a positive feedback we want it to be a negative feedback that's why we went ahead and changed the sign back so that now we have what we expected we have the two poles here we've now canceled that pole and zero there and there is our plant zero we probably want to crank up the gain obviously until we get a little bit inside the unit circle we can if we still have that figure window now this is giving us a more reasonable step response behavior for that original unstable system and so you can do that but I would forewarn you that sometimes because of the way that they are now sort of transforming or converting between different frequency variables you may have to start changing the sign and for whatever reason I don't know why they had the zero location in the left half plane but checking those now we have the cancellation here we have our plant zero at one we have two poles at two and now that looks more consistent with what we had talked about in this particular design to be consistent with what we had done in yesterday's lecture let's just look at one more unstable system well actually it will be unstable let's say that we now call this g sub 3 of z this is now a pole at the origin a pole at z equal to 1 and now we have a 0 at 2 for that particular system again if we just tried to use pure gain we would be unstable all the time with a pure gain controller we would have a pole stuck between z equal to 1 and z equal to 2 in this case it might be so this is what we have with constant gain if we now look at doing something a little bit different again we sort of have to open up the way that we think about this now instead of putting a pole somewhere out in the right half plane this is again the z plane now what we want to do is put a zero outside we could put it right there we could put it really pretty much anywhere we wanted as long as it's to the right of z equal 1 now we have and we can't just put a 0 in there that would correspond to a non-causal controller we have to introduce a pole so that we now have a causal controller now we have that on the real axis we have that on the real axis and we have this branch or that part of the root 
real axis on the root locus. These two now approach each other. They go over. One goes to that zero. The other one goes to that zero. And this one just goes off to the left. And now you can see, I hope, that there is a particular value of k. Now it's either that value to get to that point on the root locus or to get to minus 1 on the root locus that would des define your maximum choice of gain. You can start with k equal to 0, crank it up a little bit. You're going to be stable. You would now have closed loop poles, let's say, right there and maybe right there. So you would have a stable system. You wouldn't want to crank up beyond either the of the squares, and you'd have to check to see which of those particular locations gave rise to the smaller k, and that would re correspond to the upper limit on your gain for stability. The k triangle does give rise to a stable closed loop system. And in this case, we would have, let's say, C of Z equaling, let's say that we put that 0 at 1 and a half. Let's say that we put the other one at 1 half. And now we have K triangle. This particular controller would then stabilize this system, G sub 3 of Z, that was naturally unstable with just a pure gain controller. I will go ahead and stop at that point and hope that this is now a little bit easier to understand, hopefully now that we have audio.